right, praise God. Well, we've got the mic, amen? But you know, it's my, my half, I guess if I'm half Italian, I only need one hand to move. Maybe, maybe that's how that works. Hey guys, I want to welcome you to Abundant Grace. Um, this is part three of the series, Jesus, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. And uh, I'm not going to do any review of the previous messages, um, because I want to jump right in. But I, I, I will just give one, one point that we need to understand, and, and it's this. We need to have our faith in the right tense, right? And that means that there are things that have happened in the past, there are things that are happening now, and there are things that will happen. And we discussed that if we put our faith into the future... For something that has already happened, our faith is in the wrong tense. Okay? Remember? All right? So you've got the idea that, you know, the Jews are waiting for Jesus to come. They're, well, they're waiting for the Messiah to come. And because their faith is in the future, but Jesus has been revealed to be the Messiah, they're waiting for something that has already come, which means they're still waiting which means they'll never, ever, ever receive one, him, in the future. They have to receive the one who's come in the past. Why? Because if he's already come, there's not another Savior coming. So their faith must move from something that is going to be to something that has been. You got it? Okay. When we face troubles, difficulties, or problems... We need to understand when the provision has occurred. If God has promised something in the past, my faith for it to come now is not in the now. My faith for something to show up now is actually in something that was. This is major. Because many times as I'm pastoring and I'm helping people and even in my own life, I'm looking and I'm, I'm realizing we're asking God to do something he has already done. When I ask God to do something that he's already done, it means I have not believed what he's done. If I don't believe what he's done, then I'm not receiving what he can do. Because I'm assuming he hasn't done it. So what we're going to do today is, and, and this is what I shared last week, we're going to actually look at the scriptures in multiple places to see if we can find this problem. Because if we can find the problem, we can fix it. And if we can find the solution in the word, then we could adhere to the solution. You know what's going to happen? Your prayers are going to be answered. Okay, that's kind of like the key. It, it, it doesn't matter if you pray, really. If you pray in disagreement with his word, like you could fast and pray in disagreement with his word and, and it won't matter how much you do it. Did you know that no matter how much you travel south, you don't head north? But people say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to travel more. No, you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, but if I do it with all my heart, God will see. No, you're still going in the wrong direction. It's like the poor businessman. Every unit he sells, he loses money. He says, don't worry, we'll make it up in volume. You're not going to make it up. Well, we sold a lot. No, you lost more money. You can't impress God with the amount of activity and assume that he's pleased. You must impress God with faithfulness to his word. This is why long extended prayers out of the will of God produce less than even one little short prayer of faith. We even have a mentality, I need to pray long to get blessed. Why do you need to pray long to get blessed? You could pray quick because your faith is so strong in what he's already done. Amen? You're not praying long to win his favor. It doesn't work that way. 
The compassion of God is there for us, but the provision of God is not because of his compassion only. A lot of people think, well, because God has compassion on me, he's going to answer my prayer. No. No. This isn't biblical. Let me give you a description. The compassion of God provided the solution. We now need to grab the solution. When you grab the solution, the provision, you grab the compassion. But if God has compassion and he does something for us because of his compassion, but we don't believe what he did, we're not receiving his compassion. So we just assume because I have a problem, he's going to bless me because he has compassion on us. No, the compassion brought Jesus. What do you need to do? You need to eat his flesh. You need to drink his blood. Let's talk about being saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the compassion. That whoever believes in him will have eternal life. There's the response to the compassion. Isn't that beautiful? It's so simple, isn't it? But we're expecting God to do everything merely because we're having a difficult time. And I want to explain to you that he sent Jesus because he knew of our difficulty. His compassion for us should never, ever, ever be questioned. His compassion gives the provision. But you need to receive the provision. I need to receive the provision. So, you ready to dive in? All right, let's go to the book of Numbers. I'm going to cover Old Testament and New Testament. If you have ever heard anyone say, any teacher, preacher, Christian, that the Old Testament is not needed today, I would recommend that you would close that teaching down. It is out there. It is out there actually by some well-known people. The Old Testament is vital, it's important, and it's relevant. But what are they doing? There are things in the Old Testament. Did you know that there are things in the Old Testament that people figure are just old because it's called the Old Covenant? And they go, it's not relevant today. Do you know that there are things in the Old Testament that haven't happened yet? There are prophecies in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, things in the Old Testament that have not even happened yet. Hallelujah. There are things in the book of Revelation that have already happened. But we assume that Daniel is old and Revelation is new. Revelation is speaking about things before the earth was around. So when you're reading the Bible, you need to really clearly to pay attention to the order of events. And that does take time. But let's go to the book of Numbers. And we're going to, no, actually, we're going to go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis. The book of beginning. Genesis means the beginning. Look with me in chapter uh, 17. Genesis chapter 17. And a lot of controversy, by the way, in, by Bible scholarship is what did happen and what will happen. Did Matthew 24 already happen or did, is it going to happen? Well, these things that we've, we're going to speak of today, no debate about them. Genesis chapter 17, we're going to start with verse 7. God says, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. Now, he's speaking to Abram. That's in verse 1. Let's, let's actually put up verse 1, team. When Abram, Abram, what his name was changed to Abraham. Abram means a father. Abraham means father of many nations. When Abram was 99 years old, so get, get the word picture in your brain, okay? He's old. Did you get it? The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. There it is, I am. We, we, we studied this last week. Jesus is the I am. He's the in the past, in the present, in the future, all at the same time. He says, I am Almighty God. This is what the Lord is saying. Walk before me and be what? Blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly. 
Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. My covenant is with you, present tense. My covenant is with you. My covenant is with you right now. You shall be future. You catching it? My covenant is with you because my covenant is with present tense in Genesis 17 back then, okay? And you shall be future, a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Look at the text. This is really, really interesting because if you, if you were an English teacher and you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you'd think the, the writer, the Moses, recording this is, is, is doing something very wrong. He's not. This is revelatory. This is what God is saying. I am almighty right now. My covenant is with you right now. You shall be a father of many nations. But your name is going to change, he says, right? Verse number five. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. Hold on. Wait, wait, what? Did you, you, you got it. Did, wait. I am almighty. My covenant is with you. You shall be future because I have made you. Wait a minute. But I don't have any children. My covenant is with you. I have already done it. You just don't have it yet. Oh my gosh. Are we in past? Are we in present? Or are we in future? <laughs> we have all three represented in the text. You see how closely you need to read the scripture. Abraham needed to be in agreement with God. Abraham needed, the provision is there, but not yet. You see, the prophetic nature of things is already, just not yet. We have churches planted in so many nations in the entire world, hundreds of thousands of them, just not yet. Okay, we, we, we have them in nations, but we, we don't, we, we have leaders in nations, but we don't have the fullness. Why? But do we have it? We have it. What are you waiting for that you already have? Because if you're waiting for something you already have, that's active waiting. If you're waiting for something that you don't have yet, you're hoping it comes, but you're not sure. I don't know if you've ever worked for an employer that they were on time with their paycheck every single time the pay period came, every time. And you knew if Friday was coming or you knew at the end of the month or you know those two weeks or even, you know, the automatic deposit, right, and all that, you, you just knew it was there. You, you didn't even check it. You just assumed because that time came, you have it. That's how much confidence you had in your employer. Now, having said that, there are some people who have worked for some employers that you hope that, <laughs> that they paid you in the pay period. You don't know yet if you have it. So what do you do? Before you spend the money, you go and check, did I get paid? The difference is you don't know when it comes, even though it was supposed to come. Your confidence level is different. With Abraham, he heard God say, I am almighty. It precedes the whole thing. It starts with, I am almighty. Nothing is outside of possibility for what I can do in righteousness. My covenant is with you. Because my covenant is, you have been given it already. Because my covenant is made present, you have the descendants. People say, I don't have any descendants yet. God says, you have the descendants. I don't have the descendants. No, I made covenant with you now. Which means you don't have what you see. 
you have what has been covenanted to you. You should underline that, bold that, score it, circle it, do something. Tattoo it on your turtle. You don't have what you see. You have what he has covenanted with you. How many people are saved? You should put your hand up if you believe in Jesus. If not, you got to see me after service. <laughs> Salvation, you have it now. For God so loved the world that whoever he, uh, I'm sorry, for God so loved the world that he gave, past tense, gave his only begotten son that whoever believes now, present tense, will not die but have everlasting life. There's three tenses in it. I'm telling you, when, if you get this series, you're not going to read the Bible the same. You're going to be looking closely at each tense of Scripture. God has given Jesus. If you believe now, you shall be saved. Meaning, when your body is done, you have eternal life now because you believe now. But when you die, you're not going to die. You have it now, but you don't have your new body. Here, look at this. We have been saved we are being sanctified, we will inherit a new body. Some of you wish you had your new body right now. <laughs> Going to be awesome, right? That new body, come on. I got to preach about the new body one day. Because, you know, like, it, you, it, we inherit a perfect body. Like, we're going to be living in the new heaven and the new earth with new body, no aches, no pains, no, come on, Eva, right? Right? Whew. And, you know, good food. Yeah. And there's drink, too. There's all delicacies in heaven. Jesus said, I'm not going to drink this until. People think we're all floating around in heaven. Guys, no. We're also working in heaven, too. Yeah. All right, back on today's message. I started to get excited. So we believe in salvation, but we're still in these earth investments. So the very, uh, the, the very center of believing God for salvation re requires you to believe something now, receive something now that has not fully come to pass. Are, are, are you getting it? But when you have the covenant, you have it now. But you didn't see your new body, but you have it. I have a, um, I have a home in the heavenly realm now. But I'm not living in that yet. I'm living here. But when I leave this body, I'm going to move. Talk about an upgrade. Come on. No real estate tax on that puppy either. Come on. What about treasure? Do you know some of you? I can't say all of you yet. I, I don't know. Maybe all of you. Maybe very few of you have treasure in heaven. I don't know. It depends what you're doing with what your treasure is here. I don't know. I don't know how much you've invested in the kingdom. I don't know how much you've sold all to leave, follow Jesus. And so I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much you're obeying. I don't know how much you've resisted temptation to receive the crown. I don't know. Yep, that's got you thinking, didn't it? Yep, that, yep that's another message though. So the, the idea is when you live with a reality of I have, which is covenanted now, your mindset begins to change. All right, let's go back to Genesis 17. Listen, I says, verse number six, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. 
Now, I have made you a father, but I am going to make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in the generations. Did you read that? I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations. I need you to make sure you got the covenant is not just with Abraham. It's with his descendants. And he says, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you. Did you get it? I give to you and, go ahead and read that. I give to you and your, the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. I also give when I give in my covenant, I give now to you and your descendants after you. Has the land of Canaan been given? We are in Genesis 17. Many years are going to pass. Before we now come to Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 13, let's go there. The book of Numbers, chapter 13. No, let's, ah, for time, ah. Let's go to Exodus quickly to chapter 6, verse 4. God has a habit of, of reminding and assuring of the covenants that he makes. And Exodus 6, uh, 4, uh, I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. Now let's go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. Many of you know this story. I've preached about this history. It's the history of this people, the descendants of Abraham, the descendants that God spoke of, that I'm making a covenant with you, Abraham, I'm making a covenant with your descendants. These are the descendants. He said that he'd be a father of many nations. Guess what? God has created the nations. He's been found faithful. What did he give? One of the things, what did he give? He gave land. Where was the land? Canaan. It's very specific. It's not general land. It's that land. So the Lord spoke to Moses in Numbers 13.1, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Abraham had his son Isaac. Isaac had his son Jacob. Jacob had had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. So God is giving the land that he made covenant with Abraham, and now the descendants, the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, are now receiving the land. What is God saying? I have given it to you in covenant, but they don't have it yet. In Exodus, they were in slavery, In Exodus, where were they? In bondage, in the house of bondage. Do they have the land of Canaan? Yes, and not yet, but already. (laughs) They already have it, but they're not yet there, but it's already theirs. It'd be like everybody who moved into Canaan was moving into land that was already deeded to somebody else. And so Moses tells the leaders of these 12 tribes, um, it says, from each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one of one, a leader among them. And he tells them to go spy out the land. Now, do you know what happened in verse 17? Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way. And he says to survey it. He tells them what to look for. They even cut down one branch in the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. One cluster required two men to carry it. 
This is a fruitful land. They brought back the pomegranates, which symbolized fertility and the figs. And everything is a great report until we come to verse 28. So let's verse, uh, put up uh, Numbers 13, verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Who did they see? Descendants of Anak. They were like giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. So what are they saying? They're saying the land is occupied. This is our mentality. God has promised it. Therefore, nothing needs to be done to occupy it. But when they got to the land, they realized their land is fully occupied by people bigger and stronger than them in the physical. And so what did they do? They gave a bad report. Verse 30, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession. Do you hear what he said? Take possession. For we are well able to overcome it. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Why did they give a bad report? Because they were being reasonable? Because they were not denying facts? Maybe because they went in and they saw adversity and they figured they couldn't get it? It's exactly what we do. We justify our doubt. We are not repenting of doubt. We are giving excuses that we actually believe for doubt. Therefore, we are embracing doubt and in that state don't receive what God has already done. Even though he already gave their assessment of their present is in the present, with the present circumstances and facts. But their faith should be, should have been rooted in what God already said. When you're rooted in what God has already said, then you will not see the adversity with the same lens. You will see the adversity not as something that will overcome you, but as something you will overcome. And not because we're that good. Not because we're that strong. But rather because God has already done it. When they said we are like grasshoppers in our sight, it says... uh, And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. There is agreement between the giants of Anak and the people of Israel. When the doctor says that's impossible and you feel like a grasshopper and you believe that it's impossible, you have agreement for that which is blocking your blessing.
the giants of Anak were bigger than the descendants of Israel. Agreed? Physically, mentally, uh, physically in stature, right? And mentally, they're in agreement that they're smaller. The giants of Anak do not know about the covenant made in Genesis. So the giants of Anak are assessing Israel's strength based on the now, not based on the then. Why? Why is this important? Because the God who made covenant is so much infinitely bigger than the giants of Anak. That if the giants of Anak saw the size of God, that he is, I am almighty, then the giants of Anak would have been the one that would have become grasshoppers in their own sight. We often feel powerless, helpless, and that is a very scary and frustrating feeling. And that is where fear lives. Fear and uncertainty and doubt live in a realm of, I can't change this. I don't know what's going to happen to me. So when you're facing an economy without a job and you say, I don't know how I'm going to pay rent. You're trying to get somewhere. You're trying to overcome something. You're trying to, and you think that you're assessing your strength with that circumstance. You'll often walk around like grasshoppers. And what's amazing is the people that want to influence us in the world love when we think we're nothing but grasshoppers because they will lead and manipulate weak-minded people. I have peace whether great leaders are in office or not so great leaders are in office. I got great peace. Why? Because I know that they are just temporary and my God is the one that's determining what is and it is not going to happen on the earth. And my covenant is not with America, my covenant or another country, my covenant is with God. Now that doesn't make politics unimportant. It just means at the end of the day, there's a bigger throne. Amen? Now, everybody says amen to politics, but what about the doctor's report? Anybody ever, you don't have to put your hand up, but there's something called white coat syndrome. As soon as we see a white coat, we get nervous. There's something spiritual going on about that. And yeah, there, there, there's experiences that we have, but you know, there's a lot of things that when you look and you're saying, God, why do I fear man? Why do I fear man? Why am I so concerned about what other people think? Why am I concerned about what the experts say? They're the giants of Anak in theory. And then we're made to feel terrible. Has God not already sent Jesus? But why do we not believe in who he sent? Because he says, I am God Almighty. It is not I was God Almighty. He is not dead. He is alive right now. Right now. But they forgot that God had made covenant. You can't forget what God has done. And sometimes those circumstances, listen, I'm going to encourage somebody right now. Sometimes the things we're praying to change feel like unmovable mountains because we've been really trying to move that mountain. I don't know about you, but man, I've prayed for some things and there's some things that that mountain hasn't moved yet, but that mountain must move. Why? Why? Because it was already promised to move. Just because I prayed yesterday and it didn't move today doesn't mean it ain't moving tomorrow. Because the thing that's moving it isn't determined on today. The thing that's moving the mountain is determined on the thing that happened many days ago. Hallelujah. So this gives me hope. 
Brand new day, brand new prayer, brand new fresh start. The thing must move. Why? Because it was promised to move if I would believe. My faith can grow, but I can't change God. If God said the mountain is impossible to move, I got to accept it. I got to accept it. If God said that thing can't move and that will be like that no matter what I do, I got to accept it. But if God promised that if I would have faith and not doubt, that I can speak to the mountain, it will be picked up and cast into the sea, then my faith is not in the history of my performance. My faith is in the history of his word. Hallelujah. So what did they do? Well, they, they, they rebelled against God. They completely rebelled against God. They did not go in. And then God said, well, then you're never going to get it. That entire generation, those descendants, did not receive the covenant God made with them. That's why I was highlighting. They, they didn't have to say, oh, God, you made that with Abraham. We don't know if you made it with us. Nope, God spoke about them to Abraham. It was with them, but they did not inherit the Canaan land. So the enemies of Israel, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, the giants of Anak, remained occupying what was meant for them. And they wandered the desert for 40 years. But two men, two men didn't lose it, Caleb and Joshua, because they believed what God had said. We have to consider this question. Is my life lacking now because I'm like the other Israelites? Is my life lacking now because I haven't really received what God said? Is my life lacking now because I say I believe it, but I really don't? Well, you read the scripture, and you try to figure out the answer to that question. I'm giving you time to think about the answer to that question. Want to know something really awesome? Whether you have the answer to your prayer now, I'm going to diffuse and say that's not as important as to ask you what you're believing now. If I am believing that the mountain will move, but it hasn't moved, but I believe why it will move, then even though it hasn't moved, it's okay. It's going to move. Because my faith isn't in the mountain. It's in the one who said I can move it. Is this making sense? You want to go to another example? Let's do it. Let's go to the, let's go to, uh, where are we going to go? You know what I should do? I should, I. Let's go to Genesis. Before, before we leave here, we're, we're going to go to Genesis. And, and what, did, what, did God tell, what did God tell Abram, Abraham that he had to do? Um, God told Abraham that he would have to sacrifice his son, correct? I'm not going to go to the text and read the whole thing now. But God told Abram, Abraham that he would have to sacrifice his son. That means he, he would have to offer him as a burnt offering. In other words, he'd have to kill his own son. And a lot of people say, you know, how could, how could that happen? Verse 22, uh, chapter 22 of Genesis, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Verse number three. 
So Abram rose early in the morning. He didn't even delay. Now listen, there was a program, I think it's called the Bible Experience. And I told you that, you know, many times I don't like watching any dramatic versions of the scripture because they take and put human flesh and they put it into the dramatization. And frequently when I see this, they're appealing to human beings. The scripture is appealing from God's perspective many times. And when the, when the, when Hollywood, thank you, when Hollywood creates these things, it doesn't often understand God. And it assumes that a human being, if they hear that they have to kill his son, would be in torment. And so in this program that I tried to give a chance, I saw Abraham wrestling, wrestling, upset with God, you know, oh, how am I going to? It's not in the scripture. It's not in the scripture. They were representing, oh, yeah, my, that must have really been hard. Why? Because they're identifying with an Israel that forgot what God promised. Doubters. You know, I, I was walking the other day, you, you know, I was looking up at the sky, you know, because God's part of God's foot school in, in, you know, the first heaven. And I was, I was walking and I was just thinking, and I'm like, Lord, we are saturated with doubt. We, we don't appreciate how much doubt is just the norm in the world and in the church. To believe God is exemplary, even a basic thing. We don't believe God with money. Let's not say we do. Because we're not giving it. God promised, you give it, I would, I would give it back to you. Press down, press together, shaking together, and everything. We do not believe God. We do not trust God. I don't know how we're making it to heaven when we don't believe God with earthly things. I don't know. I don't know. Doubt is so rampant. We can't trust God even with basic things, but you trust him with your soul? Or do you? Maybe you don't. Maybe it's what God said, will I find faith when I come back? Will I even find it? Now, I'm not indicting you. I'm speaking in general about the generation we're living in. People sometimes come up to me and say, wow, you have a lot of faith. Compared to who? My faith is growing. But I was commanded and you were commanded to lay hands on the sick. That's not exemplary faith. That's an unprofitable servant. When you do what you're commanded to do, you're still unprofitable. We were commanded to raise the dead. But it's just, wow, somebody prayed for the sick and they got well. Sometimes I feel like, oh, just sit down. That's a basic thing. What do you mean basic? Yeah, hallelujah. That, that's God did that. But, but that's, every Christian should be... And these signs will follow those that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in other tongues. And if they drink anything deadly, poisonous, it will by no means hurt them. That's Mark chapter 16. That's those who believe. What does that say for people that don't have any of that stuff going on in their life? Oh, I believe in God. Show me. Hallelujah. Do you know why I have faith to pray for the sick? It isn't because of me. Because, man, once I look at me, I am in trouble. Oh, you don't even know. Once I look at me, I am undone. If I look at me when I'm about to pray for the sick, you might as well just get the car running because I'll get in it so we can escape. <laughs> All right? I'll sneak out the back. But as soon as I think of what Jesus has done on the cross, as soon as I think that by his stripes we are healed, as soon as I understand that it's him who is healing the sick and healing all those who are oppressed by the devil, what am I going to run from? He is right now almighty because he did what he did on the cross. So I can stand in what was done. And that's why we see miracles and that's why we've seen so many things happen. It's not because of what is, it's because of what was. 
Because what was shall determine what is. But if you don't believe what was, your is will not be determined by what was. Did you follow that? You got to figure out what past is going to determine your future. Is it going to be you or is it going to be God? It's so encouraging to understand that faith is actually going to create something that human beings don't understand. And that's why when they portrayed uh, Abram like that, and they looked at Abram like that, and they said Abram must have been so crazy upset. The Bible says he woke up early in the morning. He didn't sleep in. You know the day that you don't want to get out of bed because you've got those big meetings and you've got the such and such and you don't want to face a normal day? He woke up early. Now, I'm going to prove to you in Scripture that Abram was operating in a different way. We're going to look at the solution. We're going to look at the good side. Amen? What did Abram do? He wakes up and he says what? He says... Um, now i got to find out where that is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Genesis chapter 26, verse 6. So Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I mean, this is an intense question. It's like they prepared everything, but there's no animal. So Isaac says, okay, what's going on? We got everything but the main thing. Jesus. Verse 8, Ab then, and Abraham said, well, who said? Say it again. It's not Abram. His name has already been changed. Oh, come on, somebody. His name is not Abram. It's not father. It's Abraham. It's a father of many nations. Why? Because God has already done it. How many sons does Abram have? Abraham have. One. So Abram was changed to Abraham. So his very name is his covenant. Amen. And then Abraham only has one son. Abraham has one son, but Abraham means he has multitudes of descendants. And Abraham said, the one who has many sons said, my son. You get the power of that? My son, my only son, right? God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Listen to Abraham's answer. He doesn't say anything except what God will do. Oh, he says what God will do. He says what God will do. He's obeying the commandment, but he says what God will do. And it says, verse 9, so the two of them went together. How many? How many? Okay. Now, I'm going to take you into the past now because I'm going to highlight something in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. How many men are with him? Three. Two servants and one son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham, lift, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, how many young men? Two. Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and what? And what? Oh, my gosh. And what? Oh, no music, no team. What is he saying we're going to go do? We're going to go worship. Oh, we're going to go worship. But listen, he says, he says, the lad and I will go yonder and worship. And what? Say it again. Who? We. Who? We. we. Who's we? Me and my son are going to go. Me and my son are going to come 
back. Me and my son are going to come back. You think Abraham was fighting with God? He went to worship God. That's why I don't want to watch those movies. Because the scripture doesn't bring me into a normal human response to having to kill your son. It brings me into a supernatural faith of a man who believed God covenanted him and changed his name from Abram to Abraham. You want to believe? Yes? Do you really want to believe God? Be careful who you talk to. Be careful who you hang around with. You know, Dale Everett is in Africa right now with Pastor Pat, and they're having an amazing time. God's doing amazing things, and I love Dale. Do you know that Dale and I, we, we, we text one another, and we get on the phone with one another, and the next thing you know, the Holy Spirit, why? Because there's agreement. I mean, we could literally feel it. We could feel it even in text. We, 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 we describe it. Why? Because, when, when, because he believes God. And as he's believing God, he's helping me believe God. And as I believe God, I'm helping him believe God. And the next thing you know, there's like a belief party going on. You know? And most people are doubt parties. Oh, this is going to be hard. 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 And I'm preaching this message, listen, with some mountains that need to move. Amen? You know, I'm in it with you, you know. If the devil's attacking you, consider for a moment the kind of levels of temptation and doubt that sometimes I come against the guy that's leading. So I'm not speaking from some ivory tower. I'm in it with you. Sometimes I find myself crying, difficulty, fear, all kinds of attacks, physical, mental, spiritual, all kinds of things. So when I'm sharing this, I'm preaching myself happy too. Amen? Because we need to put our faith in what God has said. Hallelujah. So he says, we're going to come back to you. How do you bring a burnt offering back? You don't just kill the body and bring a dead corpse back. He could not have been speaking about that. It would have been ash. We are going to come back to you. Why? Because God said through Isaac, the promise is coming. Oh, hallelujah. Abraham doesn't know how. Abraham doesn't know what God's going to do. But Abraham knows that somehow Isaac is going to come back. Isaac cannot go away. Oh my goodness. How could the promise of many sons come through if Isaac is dead? Right? It has to come through Isaac. Abraham already tried Ishmael. That didn't go too good. It has to come through Isaac. God specifically said through Isaac, through him. Let's go to the New Testament to Hebrews chapter 11. Because what I'm preaching is not theory. It is not, it may be, it is not anything like that. This is sure and this is set. 11, chapter 11, verse 17. I wasn't even going to go to these verses today. I was going to move on, but you know what? Praise God. Let's look at the solution first. By faith, this is by faith, by faith. Somebody say by faith. By faith, faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. By faith, he offered him. By faith, he offered him. Not by fear did he offer him. Not by doubt did he offer him. Isaac was not a doubt offering. Oh, it's so much to share. People give, you know, $100,000, but they do it in complete doubt. Better not to give it. Better not to give it. But I gave $100,000. You gave a doubt offering. Or maybe it was a guilt offering. 
But it wasn't a love offering. And it wasn't a faith offering. Mm. Let's listen. So he offers Isaac in what? Faith. 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 Not disgruntled obedience. Faith. Not with frustration. With faith. Do you see how Abraham offered Isaac? Faith. By faith. Faith in what? Faith. It wasn't coerced. God didn't make him do it. God didn't force him to do it. He did it on his own accord. By what? Faith. You ask, why did Abraham or how did Abraham able to offer his son? How could he do that? Faith. 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 And he who had received the promises, oh my gosh. What are these promises? It's Genesis 17. It's where we started. When he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had what? Past tense. When did the testing come? After the giving of the promise. Oh, church. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Look at the tense. Because he received the promises, past tense, he offered. He offered up his only begotten son. Verse 18. Of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed, you see how specific? Offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding. Let's read it together. That God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abram turned to Abraham, received the promise through Isaac to such a degree that he was able to in the present time, in his present time, offer his son because he believed the promises he were already received. You can do things in the present that won't make sense because you believe what was promised. But because he believed in the promise of God, he believed in the resurrection. Wow. Well, I may have to slit his throat. All his blood's going to come out. Then I have to burn him. And then he's going to be nothing but ash. But it's all okay. Because God's able to raise him up. Still think you believe? You see, if we look at our faith compared to the father of faith, by the way, it's his faith uh, that he was justified. This is the father of faith. This is the one who, through whom seed we are supposed to, this is what faith looks like. What do we do? What time is it? It's 10.15. Hey, all right. Let's let's put up the graphic that I that I had uh, that I had sent. There's a lot going on here, but the promise of God comes. We're going to move from left to right. The promise of God comes through His Word. God fulfills His Word. Then circumstances come. God speaks his word, God fulfills his word, then circumstances come, and then we have to figure out what are we going to do. Either I'm going to believe in what God has spoken and fulfilled, or 
I'm going to believe and be shifted by circumstances. It's the circumstances that are pretty funky. They do weird things to us. They, 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 they shift us out from what God has done and what he's promised. Be careful what voices and what thoughts move your mind. Satan does not want us to look at what God has done. He wants us to be afraid of what will happen. Now, I'm going to let you know that God's will is in what he's spoken and God's will is in what he's done. God's will may not be in your present circumstances. In fact, Satan is doing everything he can to get us to live outside of God's word and it's outside of the promises of God. And then if, we li- if we're moved by those circumstances, then we have a faith first out reaction here, don't we? So if you look at this graphic, we have the number one option is be- God never promised it. It, it. It's a mentality that says God never did it. There's a mentality that says God didn't even promise it. Then maybe God promised it, but it's never been fulfilled. Well, if it has been fulfilled, then the green, you get these are red. I know I'm deep with the color coding, right? Like, you know, it's, it's intense. And then the green is it's ready to receive. But once we look at the circumstances, it's still ready to receive, but we're in yellow light. We put the brakes on. We're unsure. Trepidation comes. We don't know. There's a hesitancy. It's already ready to receive. What changed us were the circumstances. Abraham says, I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care if his body's dead. I don't care if his body's ash. He promised. God must do. He said it must be. Hallelujah. I'm telling you this to start to jack your faith up real strong. Am I allowed to say that? I, I, what I mean, I don't know what that means. I mean, I think I'm meaning to say, make your faith very strong. Let me be safe. Circumstances are up and down. God's word is not up and down. Sometimes I've prayed for healing and my body feels pain. I can visibly see something's not right. So I pray harder and what happens? I feel more pain. Then it gets worse. Then I pray and it gets worse. So what's the assumption? My prayer is not working. Could it be that my prayer is actually kind of like starting to have some impact, but the circumstances keep getting worse? This is where your faith is a flight or a fight. And you go, it's not working. And then where do, what do we begin doubting? God must have never have done it. I guess we misunderstood what, what the Bible says. Yes, God doesn't heal today. Let me go back into that camp with the doubters that haven't read his word. Many are there. Many are there. Many start out believing God. Many begin to believe in God, but their circumstances turn them back. I don't want to be a desert dweller. I got two people who got that. You're either going to live in Canaan or you're going to wander the wilderness for 40 years. I do not want to wander the wilderness for 40 years. The people who do not, the people who are moved by circumstances, giants of Anak, Jebusites, Hittites, they do not inherit the promise of God and the people reveal their heart. Now, I I went real fancy here. You're either going to have green or you're going to stay in yellow or you're going to stay in red. You you get the traffic light. And this, you got to figure out whether you're red, yellow, or green right now concerning the promise that God has given you. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to hand out hats 
uh, they're like paper, and you all need to put on red, yellow, or green, walk out of here and have people wonder where you are. All right? John, can you go get the hats for me? I don't have the hats. But wouldn't it be cool to see the people who were hanging in depression, they're all wearing red hats. Could you see the people that are like, like not, aren't hopeless, but they're really downtrodden, but they're really trying, they have yellow hats. And then you'll find the worshipers be like, oh, God is good, baby, God is good. <laughs> they're all wearing green hats, they have joy. Nobody had any circumstances change. It's just whether you're living in the red, the yellow, or the green. Amen? So, in truth, this is probably what most hats would look like. Yellow, green, and red, all swirled together like tie-dyes in the 60s. He'd be like, I don't know what's going to happen. Life's good, but rough things, you know, yeah. God sometimes blesses and sometimes doesn't. Listen to the language. God works in mysterious ways. Oh, God, praise the Lord. I don't know, Lord, if you want to heal, let thy will be done. It's all mixed. It's a hodgepodge of blah. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Let, you, let your study of the word of God know what he has promised. And if you feel pain and if you don't see the breakthrough, don't be in the yellow, be in the green and say, I will consider God can even raise him from the dead. And I will say that God's promise will come to pass because this is why in Romans chapter 4, it says that Abraham considered not his own body. He stopped considering the circumstances. He only considered this he was fully persuaded that God was able to perform that which he promised amen that's it for the day father bless our minds our hearts to be in alignment with you in the name of Jesus bring our faith into the right tense Lord Hallelujah. There's a lot of things we're going through and we really need to say, Lord, what have you done? I want to preach about healing so much because I know that there's people that are struggling. But listen, you've got the same Bible as me. And, and I'm just going to continue this teaching because I didn't even get to a whole bunch of the New Testament stuff to see this stuff working out because you're going to see the difference between the fruit, you know, even his resurrection. And we're eventually going to get to Romans chapter 6. So if you'd all like to read that, you can really read that and begin to study Romans chapter 6 because a whole bunch of us are stuck with sin and the Bible is saying we've died to sin. This is everywhere. This is, this is everywhere. Could you imagine not struggling with doubt anymore? Wouldn't that be great? Well, you got to believe what he did in the past in order to do that today. All right. Father, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, bless us, keep us, guide us. Lord, we pray for all the house churches um, and all of the meetings that are going to take place this week uh, as we dig into this, Lord, in Jesus' name. God bless you. Love you, church. We forgot communion. No, I guess I should rephrase that. I, I forgot communion. So here's what we're going to do. The, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why I left it to the end was because I wanted to cover Luke 24 because it speaks about the body and blood of Jesus. And so I wanted to take the, uh, the Lord's Supper with the remembrance of what he's done. But I didn't get to minister to that today. So we'll, we'll work on that next week. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Amen? Hey, hey can I tell you something? Do you know you can still have communion today? Like moms and dads, like, you know, in your home, you could, like, take the elements and read the scriptures and you can pray. Did you know that you could do that? Did you know that you don't need an ordained person to do that? Hallelujah. So you go at it, okay? Love you so much. God bless you, church.